welcome. This is the test run and service for February 14th for Holy Trinity and St. Andrew's Lutheran Church. We were supposed to be in person tomorrow, but with extremely cold wind chills and wanting to be mindful of everyone's safety early in the mornings, we will be doing a trial run of our Facebook Live worship for you today um, for you to watch at your convenience. Please stay warm and stay safe. Our Lenten midweek at home packets will be delivered um, between Saturday and Tuesday for those of you who will be staying home for Ash Wednesday. Those of you who are looking forward to coming and participating in the Lenten journey we have set up for Ash Wednesday, focusing on the seven symbols of Ash, we welcome you between the hours of four and seven. So we regret due to cold weather, we won't be in person tomorrow, but we look forward to seeing you at Ash Wednesday and next Sunday for in-person services. With that, please participate if you are watching this live and let us know how our sound is, um, how our focus is. Just like if we were in person, we would be taking the feedback from the pews as we go and we appreciate your input. To make sure that the worship service we put together in this way is as welcoming um, and life-giving as possible. So with that, I invite Ian to begin us in centering us for worship with our prelude. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, 
Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us now confess our sins in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgive, forgives all our sins. As a called and ordained minister in the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join us in singing our gathering hymn, When Morning Gilds the Skies, number 853 in the red hymnal, and 546 in the green.
Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty God, the resplendent light of your truth shines from the mountaintops into our hearts. Transfigure us by your beloved Son, and illumine the world by your image. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us now turn to God's word. The first reading according to 2 Kings. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went, and stood at some distance from them, as if both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elisha said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you, before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted to you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elisha ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. The word of the Lord. The second reading according to 2 Corinthians. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Let light shine out of the darkness who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When we are usually in person, in, be in between the readings and the gospel, we have a children's message. And in my enthusiasm to be in a closer proximity with our youth, I did plan a children's message. But let us remember that children's messages are not just for those who are young and tender in years, but they are for the whole body of Christ, for we are all God's children. So, with that, I would like to read to you a story, When I Was Young in the Mountains. It's by Cynthia Ryland, illustrated by Diane Goody. When I was young in the mountains, grandfather came home in the evening, covered with the black dust of a coal mine, and only his lips were clean, and he used them to kiss the top of my head. When I was young, in the mountains, grandmother spread the table with hot cornbread, pinto beans, and fried okra. Later, in the middle of the night, she walked through the grass with me to the Johnny house, and held my hand in the dark, I promised never to eat more than one serving of okra again. When I was young in the mountains, we walked across the cow pasture and through the woods carrying our towels. 
and the swimming hole was dark and muddy, and we sometimes saw snakes, but we jumped in anyway. On our way home, we stopped at Mr. Crawford's for a mound of white butter. Mr. Crawford and Mrs. Crawford looked alike and always smelled of sweet milk. When I was young in the mountains, we pumped pails of water from the well at the bottom of the hill and heated the water to fill round tin tubs for our baths. Afterward we, afterward, we stood in front of the old black stove, shivering and giggling while grandmother heated cocoa on top. When I was young in the mountains, we went to church in a schoolhouse on Sundays and sometimes walked with the congregation through the cow pasture to the dark swimming hole for baptisms. My cousin Peter was laid back into the water and his white shirt stuck to him and my grandmother cried. When I was young in the mountains, we listened to frogs singing at dusk and awoke to cowbells outside our windows. And sometimes a black snake came in the yard and my grandmother would threaten it with a hoe. If it did not leave, she used the hoe to kill it. Four of us once draped a very long snake, dead of course, across our necks for a photograph. When I was young, in the mountains, we sat on the porch swing in the evenings, and grandfather sharpened my pencil with his pocket knife, and grandmother sometimes shelled beans and sometimes braided my hair. The dogs lay around us and the stars sparkled in the sky. A bobwhite whistled in the forest. Papa what? When I was young, in the mountains, I never wanted to go to the ocean, and I never wanted to go to the desert. I never wanted to go anywhere else in the world, for I was in the mountains, and that was always enough. The end. Our gospel story today talks about an encounter on the mountain, and how desperate those who encountered the love and the glory of God were to stay on the mountain. And you have people that you have grown up around who can tell you stories of when they were little, when they found a home, or the home that they grew up in that they never wanted to leave. I remember hearing my grandmother's stories about church, about being young enough to remember when the preacher only came once a year for communion because everyone spoke Norwegian and you had to wait a whole year for the Norwegian preacher to come to give communion, or how the men all sat on one side and the women and the children sat on the other side. And she could remember when she was little, going to church to learn how to speak English, to read the Bible in English to her parents. Someday, those of you who are young and still very small will have your own stories about when you were little and the place that you found home and how wonderful life is now, but just a little wistful of the things that have been left behind. Wherever you go, whether you're looking back on your past or you're looking fondly to the future, Jesus Christ is there with you, making home wherever you go. As we re-enter our sanctuaries, we're going to want to stay again. So we're going to be wearing masks and we're going to be spacing out. We're going to be careful until the very oldest and the very youngest have had a chance to get vaccinated and adjust and someday, when you're older, you will be able to tell the story about how you encounter God in the midst of a pandemic in some really bizarre ways, but in some really holy ways, too. So with that, would you please pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for claiming us as your children and for reminding us that we are always your children, no matter how young and tender we are or how seasoned and experienced we may be. We are your children. And when the earth was still young, you made mountains and you made good things grow on them. 
And on those mountains, we look to see your glory and your love revealed. Help us to take it wherever we go. In your name we pray. Amen. So thank you to you kiddos who metaphorically came forward for a children's message. And for those of you intellectuals who love a longer sermon, buckle in, here we go. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up to a mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. <clears throat> so this past weekend, my parents came to visit, and it was the first time we had hosted them in our house for the last 13 months, which for us is a very long time to go. And those of you who are on Facebook, this will be old news, but Grandpa Mark came and asked Runa to cut his hair. He had been growing his beard and his hair for a very long time, and he wanted Runa, our four-year-old, to cut it. And before she began, her tiny little hands holding this big electric clipper, he looked at her and said, there is no way you could ever mess this up. And I saw Rena's eyes kind of go big because I don't think she thought she could mess it up. But it was powerful to hear those words, there is no way that you could possibly mess this up. Whereas mom, standing next to her four-year-old about ready to cut grandpa's hair, thought there's a couple of ways that this could go wrong actually. Even if the hair was a little wild, I thought, maybe it doesn't look too bad. We don't want to have any ER trips here. There is something comforting about knowing who you invite into your lives to do the sacred and intimate things of caring for us. And there is something comforting about normal, and it leads us to resist change. It is normal in my mind that an adult cuts another adult's hair and not a four-year-old. But at the same time, isn't that what God asks all of us to do? To participate in life? To learn even when we are young? And didn't Jesus call the disciples who were fishermen and builders and tax collectors, didn't Jesus call them to become disciples of Christ? something new and different, something that you can see the disciples resist in all of the stories. And we also hear it in our Old Testament reading. Elisha cannot envision a life where God would call him to ministry without the guidance of his teacher, Elijah, who is impressive and profound in his prophetic wisdom and Elijah was happy to follow Elijah wherever he went. But he couldn't envision a world where God would ask him to do it on his own. He could only see how things would get worse. For him, harder. Harder to discern where God is calling him to go. Harder to find the certainty that you are doing what God asks. And then we have Peter in our New Testament story. Who never imagined to meet his heroes, of Elijah and Moses. 
And so naturally, he wants to do everything in his power to keep this newfound beauty, this newfound holiness that feels big and overwhelming and terrifying. And, and he's willing to do what he can to keep it that way. So I found myself asking this week, what are some of the changes that you have encountered lately? A change in your appearance like a haircut. A change in vocation based on the demands and the realities of life. A change in who you are living your life among and who you have said goodbye to. What are the fears, the desires, and the hopes that you have had to face because of those changes? I have gotten used to preaching for our recorded services just steps away from the camera. And as we transition back into in-person worship, what should feel familiar by preaching in a pulpit feels too far away from those who will be joining us online for the next several months. I fear that when we gather in person again, it won't be the same and we won't be able to overcome those differences. I fear the ease of online worship will prevent people from coming to church on Sundays. I fear that we won't do outdoor services in the summer for as wonderful as they were. Sometimes it gets hot. There are many things that we fear but we also desire being together. We also desire fellowship and camaraderie and the sacredness of being able to see one another's eyes, to touch one another's hands, and we have hopes that God has made us stronger through these trials and tribulations. We have hopes that God will not abandon us. And maybe you picked that up in the first readings. Elijah was afraid that he was not going to be good enough without his teacher. And he had to face that uncertainty and trust in God's call over the certainty and the comfort of Elijah's leadership. Peter and James and John had to encounter the fear of witnessing their teacher, who was a friend and a rabbi, be transfigured into someone completely unfamiliar. A man that they have left everything behind to follow all of a sudden doesn't look, doesn't sound, isn't like what they remembered because he has been transformed and transfigured. Confusion, fear, caution, wonder, and a lot of other reasonable changes. That is how they went forward with Christ. And it changed also how they would encounter his resurrection. Because as Jesus Christ is raised from the dead at Easter, and every Sunday is a mini Easter, Jesus Christ is resurrected, and he is once again transformed. And the disciples don't remember and recognize him then either. And speaking of resurrections, we're doing a lot of befores and after images here. Grandpa before haircut and Grandpa post haircut. Elijah post whirlwind and fiery chariots and Elijah post. Talking about the disciples, pre-transfiguration and Jesus post-transfiguration. One of the most common images we use for resurrection and one of the most common Images we use for before and after transformations is butterflies. You start with a caterpillar, and when they're done making their cocoons, what we don't see is that that caterpillar disintegrates into a giant blob of goo. It is completely deconstructed. It has its own chemical, biological process where it is completely not a caterpillar anymore. But it's also not got a butterfly. And there is before when it was one thing. And there is after when it is another thing. And then there is the time when it is just a blob of goo. 
which of these states do you relate to? Before, after, or stuck in the middle as a pile of goo? Elijah's pile of goo is when he sits down. After the chariot is gone, he sits down and he rips his clothes and he wails and he laments in his distress. Because no matter how much he didn't want Elijah to go, Elijah still went. And no matter how much he didn't want to do ministry and be a prophet without his partner in ministry, God still had a call for him. And it's not a given that Elijah is going to stand up and go forth and do ministry. We do see him metaphorically turn to that pile of goo before he does indeed stand up and journey forth. The disciples... The disciples are standing on the mountain and they see Jesus transfigured and they turn into a hopeful but also terrified pile of goo because they understand that they are in the majesty and glory of something they never thought they would ever encounter and they want to keep it that way. They want to make sure that they don't make God angry and they don't offend Moses and Elijah because they know that these are big deals. And they're also a little uncertain about Jesus because he's not the same to them now. It's not a given factor that the disciples are going to come down off that mountain. In their pile of goo state, they say, let's build households, let's stay here. And the voice of God says, this is my son, my beloved, listen to him. And Jesus invites them to go down the mountain instead of stay up on the mountaintop where that holy ground will forever call them. It's not a given that they would follow Jesus, this transfigured friend, now a stranger, back down. And yet, they do. And then there's you and there's I. Pre-2020 and post-2020, and I won't even begin to try to sum up all of the different befores and afters you have experienced, all of the different times that we have related to that pile of goo, more than we related to anything else. There has been trauma and stress and uncertainty in this past year. And we go forth into this coming year hopeful, with joy, and with great relief that there have been gifts given to us. But it doesn't stop us from pausing. From pausing like Elijah and the disciples did before we transition fully across that threshold. Every day, we have to cross thresholds. Confession into forgiveness, lamentation into new life, brokenness into reconciliation, self-righteousness into servanthood, sinner into redeemed. God is a God who both uses us in our pre-state and our post-state, but God is a God who is revealed to us when we kneel in the dust and rip our clothes, when we stand terrified on mountaintops, uncertain of where to go, and when we are deconstructed into piles of goo before we are resurrected into new life. Change is hard, it's scary, it's often unexpected, it's daunting, but it is also inevitable. And we have boundaries that are put in place for a reason to keep us and our neighbors safe so that everyone is respected, that healthy relationships are maintained. But then there are also thresholds. 
moments and encounters where God asks you to step from where you are now into a state of change or out of the state of change into new life. Today marks the close of the liturgical season of Epiphany, a season of light. And in fact, I brought my alb home so I could wash it and I could <laughs> bleach it so it would be beautiful and white. And then we ended up recording on Saturday instead, so it's home wet. Transformation and the light of Epiphany crosses the threshold at Ash Wednesday into Lent, into a season of dust and darkness repentance, all for the sake of reconciliation, where that transformation and new life is possible. So I don't know what losses or what sorrows we will cross as we go through the wilderness of Lent. I don't know what joys or fears or expectations you are holding to as you are invited to step from one season of the church into the next but that there is one thing that we can gain from these stories, both in our Old Testament and our New Testament readings today. It's that God is a God who invites us to cross over into new life. Because resurrection is ours on the other side of any transition, on the other side of any change. You are dust. And to dust you shall return is what we will remind you on Wednesday. It's okay if you are still standing on the threshold of being asked to be transformed. And it's okay if you are being asked from that state of goo and being made new in, to step into resurrection life. Please pray with me. Gracious God, help us to trust that the God you were for us when we were young and living in the mountains is a God who journeys forth with us as we are old and still journeying through valleys. Help us to trust that you bear witness to us through whatever change we go through. And help us live fully in the resurrection that you offer. And in your name we pray. Amen. Please join us in singing our hymn of the day, Healer of Our Every Ill, number 612 in the Red Hymnal.
Our service continues as we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For the gospel proclaimed in word and deed, for communities of faith near and far, and for all who show the face of Christ throughout the world, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For creation, sun, moon, and stars, life forming in the dark earth and ocean deep, mountains, clouds, and storms, creatures seen and unseen, and for the Holy Spirit's guidance in our stewardship of God's creation, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those responsible for safety and protection, for emergency responders and security guards, attorneys and advocates, civil servants and leaders of governments, that they witness to mercy and justice throughout the world. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For all who suffer this day, that Christ, our healer, transform sickness into health, loneliness into companionship, bereavement into consolation, and suffering into peace. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For companions on life's journey in this worshiping community, for loved ones who cannot be with us this day, for guidance during struggles we face, that God's glory is revealed around and among us. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. In thanksgiving for the faithful departed who now rest from their earthly pilgrimage, that their lives of servants and prayer inspire us in our living, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people spoken or silent for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. As we turn to communion, I invite you to gather your wine or your grape juice or water, your bread or your wafers and crackers, and come to the table that Christ has prepared. Because our God shows up where God has promised to show up, and he has promised to be revealed here. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts and let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and broke it. He gave us to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and blessed it. He gave thanks. He gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, 
as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Before we conclude our service, just a couple of announcements. This is why we're doing a trial one day, because I move a lot. What <laughs> we're in person for worship. Uh, just some reminders that we do have in-person Ash Wednesday services here at Holy Trinity, 4 p.m. to 7 those of you from our 4 p.m. to 7 is too late. First Lutheran um, here in Newton is doing their Ash Wednesday a bit earlier. There is from 2 to 4. So we invite you wherever you go as a child of God to encounter the promises of Christ as we enter into the season of Lent. Um, there are options. Let us know if there's anything we can do to help. In your Lent at home bags, there will, there will also be an Ash Wednesday service with ashes. Um, they are dry, and you may put them on, um, you can apply them dry or add oil. Please do not mix water with your ashes. That will cause a reaction that will most likely burn your skin. Um, so please use them dry or add oil. Um, or for those of you um, whom you might not have ashes or be comfortable doing that, you can use water. Because whenever we put the ashes on our forehead, it is a reminder of the water and the oil that is marked on us in our baptism, claiming us as a child of God. So there will be all of those options for you in your Lent at Home packets for those for whom staying home on Ash Wednesday is a necessity. We also welcome you back to in-person worship starting next Sunday, not the 14th, but the next Sunday. Um, when it will be a little warmer and a little safer to do so. We'll still have masks worn in the sanctuary and we'll be spacing out, um, but we're really looking forward to a full service with you all next weekend. Please reach out to the office if there's anything else we can do to help support you, um, or if you have any questions about transitioning back to in-person worship. With that, please receive a blessing. God, the Creator, strengthen you. Jesus, the beloved, fill you, and the Holy Spirit, the comforter, keep you in peace. Amen. Please join us in singing or sending him, Guide Me Ever, Great Redeemer, 618 in the red hymnal, 343 in the green.
Thanks be to God. Amen.